I was always the only nigga in a room filled with white kids. And I see not much has changed. I have known I was a black child as early as four years old. Looking around my hard-earned private school classroom, I felt my difference, that something was askew, like a wooden table with a short leg. I was just somehow off. Even as a baby, I knew that my value was not that of my classmates. The words, I'm not right, beat steadily alongside my heart. I'm not right. I'm not right. I'm not right. But before you get your white guilt and assumptions all in a twist, don't feel bad for me. My upbringing resembled that of the Huxtable kids. I dressed like Denise, read like Sandra, was a sweet-talking baby like Rudy, and fuck, what was Vanessa's purpose? She seriously was the blackest of the black sheep. You know, my father, a Rhodes Scholar, which is an international postgraduate award for non-British students to study at the University of Oxford, as elaborated on his will, Cecil Rhodes' goals in creating the Rhodes Scholarship were to promote civic-minded leadership among young colonists with moral force of character and instincts to lead for the recovery of the United States and for the making of the Anglo-Saxon race but one empire. My father, Billy, an inner-city Chicago kid, received this scholarship enabling William to be the first black partner in San Diego and then a federal judge. In his courtroom, a defendant named James Brown came to defend his case. My father looked at him and said, James Brown, huh? Well, where's your new bag? <laughs> the courtroom burst into laughter. Billy's humor has always helped William put others at ease. He also wears dope ass motherfucking bow ties, which is his interpretation of Cliff Huxtable's sweater. <laughs> My mother, Dana, is a real Claire level queen, an artist. Every meal, wall, outfit is pure and filtered expression. I remember her picking me up from school wearing a floor-length bejeweled calf can and limited edition Karl Lagerfeld shades blasting Benny and the Jets in our teal sob. All I wanted was for her to wear holiday-themed sweaters and light-up pins like my teachers and the other moms. But I credit her stunning example and powerful aesthetic for my bougie, fancy bitch ass that likes nice shit. <laughs> Sue me. My mother is also tough. Her love is often given in the form of brutal honesty, logic, with a no-frills delivery, and she can be as curt and sharp as Claire's notorious side-eye, which, believe it or not, was not the easiest for a cripplingly sensitive, skin-turned outside elderly woman in a child's body person like me. I knew not to be arrogant about my Huxtable-like privilege, because I always felt like a guest in these worlds. And while in many ways I was wrapped in silk, I was made equally aware of my relationship with cotton, our chosen path of survival was to serve as ambassadors of our race, knowing that many will hang attributes to the black skin after interacting with one of us. Our job is to carry blackness with dignity, intelligence, and grace, as our parents and grandparents have. We do not speak for ourselves. We speak, behave, and carry ourselves with the dignity that honors the innocent blood of those who came before us, fought for my opportunity to stand in this room, but stand at the front of this room. We must represent our people well, always. There will be many a time when you want to cry or laugh louder or times in which your body is filled with so much fucking rage. But even when every part of you is screaming, you smile and say thank you, or sometimes even, why yes, I can certainly handle more. My parents exposed us to everything, museums, ballet, opera, swimming pools, piano, camp. And there I would be, two Afro puffs in a room filled with high ponytails, and those ones could get fucking wet. My mother and pr father pray prayed every day for a chocolate brown baby girl who would love the ocean and play the piano better than Vladimir Horowitz. They very much wanted a dark-skinned brown baby girl. In some parts of the world, the most unwanted thing. They were going to raise her to love herself, even if that sent me kicking and screaming, of which I am skilled. Our arguments over my hair being the worst. I had fucking wool instead of long flowing hair. And every time we went to the beauty supply store to re-up on my natural hair care products, I whined over the Just For Me box, a relaxer designed for little girls. I thought, if only I too could have a side ponytail, surely Zach Morris will fall in love with me then. <laughs> my mother fought me daily, a battle of which I am grateful for. She fought to, kept, she fought to keep me black. She made me grapple with myself until I saw my features for what they were and are, beautiful. I learned to not shy away from environments in which I was different, 
and come my sophomore year of high school, she found another opportunity for me to harness token power. She became drawn to the whitest sport in the world, threading our love of water within it, rowing. My mom signed us up for free class at the Mission Bay Aquatic Center, and a week later I joined San Diego Rowing Club's junior team. My novice year wasn't too bad. I had the old pains of I'm not right, I'm not right, but I made a few solid friends and lost some LBs and was even being eyed for varsity at the time. Novice year, while intimidating, felt like kindergarten, safe, complimentary, and fun. But my varsity year resembled middle school. All of these teenagers, and unlike novice year, there were actual boys here. What the fuck? I went to an all-girls school, and my friends and I had real contests to see who could grow their leg hair the longest in the winter. I did not do teenage boys in both ways. <laughs> I have always hated spending time socializing with my peer group when guys were present. The girls become catty and the boys imbeciles. I've always been a 60-year-old woman chain-smoking in a chaise lounge, preferring to hang out with the parents versus the peers. So there I was, a 60-year-old colored girl who was now team captain of the varsity team. Now, unlike other sports, crew is all year long. August through May, practices six days a week, sometimes 4 a.m. practice before school and 4 p.m. after school. We had regattas or races at least once a month, sometimes twice. Regattas take over the whole weekend. You wake up at 2 a.m., get to Long Beach by 4, prepare the boats, assemble the tracks, unload the giant truck, race all day, sometimes four races in a day. One and a half miles each, sometimes 3.7 miles. Then you break down each boat. The best parts of racing were when I knew my parents would take me to in and out after. So I was racing harder, not to improve my time, but to get to my tray of animal fries faster. <laughs> I loved the late night rows, chasing the rare moment when the boat is perfectly balanced and the oars don't touch the water until all eight people drop them in together and pull with raw power. My most favorite memories are of late night rows during red tide, which came frequently during late spring. Every time our oars plopped into the bay, hypnotic liqueur colored water would trail behind us. And these bliss filled moments accounted for 10% of my experience rowing. The other 90% was a test in surviving the social realms. The JV and varsity teams were comprised of kids who had a second chance at popularity. In their respective high schools, they were somewhere in the middle. But at crew, they had a chance to be the belle of the ball, the hot guy. So their propensity for cruelty was even stronger because they had something to prove. Of course, we know to themselves. Issues on land always translated to issues on water. In addition, my teammates had begun a cruel joke that I had slept with my, with my coach and would actually meet our competitors with this cruel, cruel lie. The person responsible for buffing out our issues and through resolving all of these lies was our varsity coach, Gregory Trail Logat. He did not live up to the name Trail. Trail insinuates adventure, color, nature. He was more like a barren desert than a trail. Everyone has had a manager whose technical skills led them to a promotion, but they are completely void of emotional intelligence and people skills to actually run that particular position. See, that was Greg a great rower, technically skilled, but the last person in the world with whom one should entrust the self-esteem of the most vulnerable demographic, teenage girls. He turned a blind eye to the fact that he had the rare opportunity to use his voice to protect, encourage, or improve the sheep under his watch. Even worse, he sometimes, however discreetly, participated in excluding the weaker, slower, or dorkier kids on the team. Dorky kids like Sarah. Her government name was Sarah, but she went by Haruka after a Japanese anime character. She refused to shave her legs, had a bull haircut, and to make matters worse, she looked exactly like the stereotypical character or a portrayal of a harsh German masseuse. There's always that one kid in class that just can't quite process anger, and they heave when they're frustrated having a literal tantrum, and that was Haruka. She had her weekly explosions, and truthfully, many of them were warranted. She expressed her frustration at people's shiftiness and bullying while the rest of us hid it. So when red-faced Haruka cried and stormed off, everyone either laughed or rolled their eyes. Greg, frustrated by a need to use empathy, compassion, or kindness, would send me after her, you know, to do his fucking job of coaching. <laughs> Come my second year on varsity, a kid standing at 6'7 joined the team. Ryan Stute wore black eyeliner, a spiked collar, his locks dyed jet black hair resembled a bob. 
It was rumored last year, his novice year, that he was a Nazi and a proud racist. Every time I walked by him, I felt a chill, and his darkness terrified me. And I made sure to always contort myself around him, to walk around him versus next to him. It was fall, and we were a few months into the season. We had just carried the boats in and were washing them down. Only 30 more minutes until I can go home. Only seven more months until I'm done, I thought. Ryan was picking on a little novice kid, a freshman who was a coxswain coming at around 90 pounds. He was dangling his shoe in the air, laughing, and watching his little minion struggle. The blonde, curly-haired kid laughed, trying to pass it off that he was in on the joke, but we all knew better. The next 30 seconds are a blur. My boatmates swirled around me, pushing me forward, encouraging me to defend this kid. You're the team captain, Skylar. Go make him stop. Go. Before I could formulate an answer, I was standing before him, and I had to force each word out. My voice cracked. Return his shoe now. He paused, looking at me coolly. What the fuck did you say? Fuck, fuck. I try harder, firmer, standing taller. I said, give him his shoe, now. What the fuck is it to you, bitch? My boatmates ushered me away, telling him off. Smart move, jackass, telling, him off, telling off the team captain. I went home trembling, because I know he would have hit me, possibly worse. Mm, if this had been the 50s, 60s, no, 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 fuck it. <laughs> if there were fewer, fewer people around, it would have just been us. He would have hit me, or possibly worse. So I did, I went home and did what every respectable teenager in 2003 did. I logged onto my AOL account, screen name Afros Forever 04. <laughs> and Moti, my longtime sister and the only other sister on the team, forwarded Ryan's away message, and she warns me, preparing me to stay calm, as real allies do. I open it. This bitch tried to step to me today. I will fucking kill her. I hate black people. I didn't feel comfortable being at practice and was forced to tell my parents about what had happened. They made me tell Greg and Ryan was suspended for a few days. My dad and I were to have a meeting with Greg the next day. Ryan his, and his dad were to follow. My father and I sat down and had a real conversation in which he shared his horrific experience of being chased by an angry mob for going to the beach with my grandma. He reminded me that it is my duty to serve as an extension of Christ, to forgive and to love. Greg told me it's my choice to kick Ryan off of the team or let him stay. I see I'm doing your job again. There was no space for me to react the way I felt called to. My job is to take on the burden of my people before me, lift my head, show up the next day, and extend undeserved grace. People sang hymns of joy during beatings because it's the boldest act of defiance. You can take my body, but you cannot take my joy. So I sang the hymn as loudly as I could, and I let Ryan stay on the team. My father followed with, Ryan stays on one condition. He is to be treated as an equal, the same as everyone else, he is not to be an outcast by any of her teammates or by any of you. Greg nodded his head. Ryan came back to practice. Greg sent the men and women's team on a five mile run and Ryan breezed right past me. My run turned into a jog and then a walk. The weight of my blackness was just too heavy today. Greg said nothing to me about what had transpired. My teammates had moved on and the novelty of gossip had worn off. I'm not a rower anymore, and I don't want to be. My parents, being the steadfast, loyal, and solid as oak Puritan Christians that they are, had a firm stance on suffering. It does a body good. If Jesus could do it, through his grace, you can too. My parents placed me on the proverbial platform of the ambassador's perseverance and forced me to honor my commitment to my team. So I fought back, and I didn't speak. One day, then five, then seven. Not one word. My silence was loud and clear, and my pi parents finally let me quit. And my silence towards my parents was the first time I ever really mustered womanly courage. I stood up for myself, boasting the audacious truth that I knew what was best for me, better than my peers, better than my coach, or my parents. It's the first time I sang a hymn in the face of ugly, the first time I had the audacity to buy into my body, my choice, 
the first time I placed myself above the duty of ambassadorship and actually touched the thin veil between keeping the peace when it's actually your own self-denial. The first time I said, this is not right, versus I am not right. I earned the first of many threads that would make up the intricate and ornate weaving of black woman. Thank you.